Welcome to everyone to this discussion on fashion and farming put on by Chelsea Green Publishing and Groundswell. Um, this event is a part of a short webinar series from Chelsea Green Publishing and Groundswell and the idea is to bring together the voices in regenerative farming. Um, the event will be recorded, so if you miss any of it, you can watch it later, and it's available, it will be available on the Chelsea Green YouTube channel. Um, please do let us know your thoughts or comments throughout the event. You can use the Q&A button um, on your Zoom panel to ask any questions. We will have 15 minutes for questions at the end, um, and we will be taking questions from the Q&A section. Um, and of course, you can write in the chat too. Um, and yeah, please do that kind of consistently throughout so that we can uh, get straight into it towards the end of the chat. And I want to say a little bit about myself. I'm Abby Rose. I make a podcast called Farmerama Radio, sharing the voices of the regenerative farming community. Um, and I also make some apps. My company, Vita Cycle, we make apps to support people monitoring soil health um, and also vineyards and agroforestry all looking to build ecology, profitability, and beauty on farms. Um, so first up, I wanted to introduce, we're really, really excited to have Rebecca Burgess here today. Um, I'm gonna share a little, bit, Rebecca, a little bit about Rebecca first. She's the executive director of Fibershed and chair of the board for Carbon Cycle Institute. She's the author of two books, one of which is extremely relevant to today's talk. The Fiber Shed book, um, highly, highly recommended. It's published by Chelsea Green um, and you can get it anywhere online and it's a brilliant read. Um, so Fiber Shed is her, first, her second book and then also she wrote Harvesting Color. She's a vocationally trained weaver and natural dyer with over a decade of experience writing and implementing hands-on curricula that focus on the intersection of restoration ecology and fiber systems. And really what we're talking about today is the fiber shed where Rebecca has built an extensive network of farmers and artisans in the Northern California fiber shed to pilot an innovative fiber systems model at the community scale. And really excitingly, fiber shed has become internationally recognized with over 53 fiber shed communities now in existence. And today we're gonna to talk with some of the UK based fiber sheds as well. So, First up, I wanted to invite Rebecca to share a little bit about how Fibershed started, what it is, and how the movement has evolved. Oh, thank you so much, Abby and uh, Deborah, Emma, for all of us being here today. It's a joy to have this opportunity to not have to fly, to be on Zoom. Um, I will screen share, um, if that's okay and do the intro uh, via some visuals that can help us um, let's see, connect um, with this storyline, <laughs> which began for me. I'm <clears throat> north of San Francisco, just to orient everybody, <clears throat> probably an hour, hour and a half uh, near the Point Reyes National Seashore. Um, and uh, the the home community that I started this project in, I am still in that home community and the same watershed. And within um, 150 mile radius of where I sit today is the primary geography where a lot of our organizing work is still done uh, and continues to be done. And the project started um, with an exploration of the idea of extending the basic understanding of human need. We have, we need food, we need water, we need shelter. And what is the strategic geography that defines the resource base for those very necessary life-giving elements? So like a watershed, like a food shed, a fiber shed defines the strategic geography that provides your first form of shelter. And this project started before social media. It started before really the advent or the kind of um, inflection point that Facebook has hit or Instagram or Twitter. I mean, I don't even think Twitter existed. Um, LinkedIn, all these things. We didn't really have ways of organizing one, one another through social media when I started the project in 2000. 
2008, 2009, I had started to feel that I had to align my values for natural dye work and weaving with my love of um, restoring ecosystems, which I've been at a small scale doing with public school children, putting in native plant dye gardens, helping people understand native flora and its relationship to material culture. That had been a big part of my life and work. So that intersection between material culture, native landscape, and the clothes I wear was really the intersectionality that I was looking to achieve through using myself as a guinea pig for the experiment. So without the tools we have today to connect with one another, I was walking the pavement, going to centers where retired citizens lived who had knitting skills, driving country roads looking for sheep. Um, I was tr literally trying to figure out how to dress myself within a 150 mile radius of my front door. All the fiber, all the dye, and the human community to metabolize those materials into textiles was what I was trying to build so that I could wear clothing for one year that represented the place that I lived systemically, not like a t-shirt that said, I'm from Marin County, California, printed on it, <laughs> but deeper, the deeper layers of meaning I was looking for. And so these, this is a map of all the people that um, contributed to one wardrobe, um, which was about 36 items of clothing, I wanna say. Might've been a little more, but socks and underwear, bathing suit. And here you see concentrations of human beings in San Francisco, um, Oakland, Berkeley, and then you see less concentration of people out in the rural areas who are raising the cotton and, and the wool. And it was collaborations between these denser populated urban areas where the design community existed with the rural communities that was the heartbeat of the creation process. Um, and here's an example of a design student working with a farmer a 10 acre farm that's very focused on adaptive managed grazing. The farmer is Robin Lind. She's raising a Jacob sheep. Casey Dapp knitted the wool. It was spun and knit. Um, it was spun on farm, knit by Casey who lived in San Francisco. I wore that shirt for one year, um, kept me warm throughout the winter. I wore it every day for three months, in fact, and I would layer on top of it um, if I got really cold, but it was kind of like a hand knit base layer. Um, this is the piece I wore in the fields when I worked. I, I had to honor my craving for blue because um, I couldn't achieve the color blue bioregionally when I began the project. So I started to grow my own indigo um, and I grew a Japanese variety, Persicaria tinctoria. And I worked very hard in the fields. I scaled my gardens up to an acre of land and managed it by hand. <laughs> anyway, that process um, exposed me to a lot of sunlight, of course, during the day. So I was looking to protect myself in heat, but um, also have airflow. So this I call this a sweater that I wore in the fields and it's um, made by Allison Riley, who was 19 at the time and a 98 year old farmer who ran, ran, ran a ranch named Utopia Ranch. She's a hun she died at 105 just last year. Um, and she ran sheep until she was 105. Um, so all these women I met, you know, a lot of what happened in the 1960s and 70s, and at least in my area, was people were looking to move back to the land. We call it the back to the land movement. Um, a lot of those women and men are in their 60s and 70s. A lot of people who retired from conventional agriculture and wanted to do biodynamic agriculture or organic agriculture and do smaller scale, more biointensive ag. I was intersecting with a lot of these people and I had not any prior knowledge of their existence. I had no prior knowledge of their products or goods. Um, so this is the proceeds of that relationship building process. You see black walnut and horsetail and indigo dyed sweaters with uh, Corydale wool that I hand spun in my living room and then went to another designer in Oakland to be knit. Alpaca, some of the finest alpaca that you see those browns and blacks, those are the color of the animal. The skirt is the color of the cotton. Um, the leg warmers, it's the color of the sheep. The only thing dyed in this image is the, the blue um, and some of the light shaded pinks. Um, I'll just go back to it. So the wardrobe really looked a lot like this. This is how I dressed myself. Um, <laughs> and um, here, uh, these are just reasons why, just a little moment of inspiration or not. 
why I was doing this work. Um, by the time I started this work in 2010, you can see how much of fast fashion was starting to use polyester, which is basically a fossil carbon derived material um, that comes at the expense of our climate, our marine ecosystems, our bodies, our soil, our drinking water. And fast fashion blends it into everything to make price points cheap, but those price points are subsidized by war economies. Um, that's fossil carbon. It's very defended by our tax dollars in the United States. And so I, I really feel like the fiber shed wardrobe had beer, bigger geopolitical implications. And I continue to feel like that, especially living in an Anglophile colonist, you know, I, my ancestors are colonizers. And so for me, it was about bringing myself into relationship with place uh, and bucking the trend to continue to see everything as a resource for my consumption, but instead building out like, and I'm still on the journey to this because I'm unpacking my own baggage all the time, but um, the idea of bringing myself into relationship with soil, caring for that soil seems like a revolutionary act in a state that's lost so much of the carbon in the soil. Um, making natural fiber garments in the face of the reality that most of what we have access to are synthetics. Um, these small acts of taking responsibility felt very monumental to me and again treating myself like a guinea pig for this political economic environmental experiment felt like a responsible thing to do at the time it continues to feel responsible I know at this point we have so many in this in the country I'm in now so many big things to do at the policy level so I kind of try to balance between what we do politically at a larger level and what I continue to do personally in my personal life. Um, the other thing I felt like I was bucking the trend on is waste. Um, you know, the Ellen MacArthur stat, two dump trucks full of waste are going out to incineration or landfill of textile waste per, I think it's per second or two seconds. Um, those kinds of stats, regardless of their complete accuracy, do show us that we have we have inventory of textile that gets sewn by amazing people and never, never gets sewn, but never sold. We have people incinerating unsold inventory. We have people owning clothing for half the lifespan that they did even 10 years ago. Um, so when you actually make your clothes with your community, they're treasures and each piece reminds you of every human or plant involved. And if you have a relationship with all those people, there's no way you toss that clothing out. It just intrinsically is, doesn't work. You can't do it because <laughs> you're in relationship with it. So there's a preciousness to the, to the work to live and, and live and clothe yourself in a fiber shed that I think in the, in the way, uh, in a way flies in the face of the production of waste. Um, and then the model really sit, sits within this vision of soil to soil. This is our vision of circular economics. Um, it came out of us developing a model for processing our underutilized wool in our community. Continues to be a journey that we're on, but this vision of rebuilding our soil. Um, and then in those systems that are regenerating that carbon pool, developing um, right relationship with the economics of the farmer. What does the farmer need to stay uh, economically solvent, paying the fair price at the farm gate, um, processing the materials locally, having designers and makers in the community use those textiles to develop the finished good, wearing that good, and then making sure at the end of many mending attempts and recycling attempts that the clothing can go back to that soil in completeness and it becomes food for the microbial community and it does not bioaccumulate in our bodies or the bodies of other sentient beings the way that plastic does. Um, so this is the model that we, um, we organize for and we organize within. And I think this, I know this is the last slide, but I just wanted to point to, I didn't know this, this map didn't exist when I started this project, but we found out that now our state that we live in is now the largest wool producer in the United States, California. No Californians I knew, other than maybe a, a, be a hand knit beanie or a hand knit scarf, no one I knew was wearing California wool. Everything was being imported from Australia and New Zealand, yet we have micron counts and fine enough wool to create the textiles that we were importing. Um, and these circles represent flocks of sheep. The larger circles are a thousand head of sheep. The smaller circles are smaller units. Um, 
and the darker circles show you the, the finer micron count and the lighter circles show you the coarser wool. So we have a lot of fine wool, especially in the drier, hotter places in California. And why we're rebuilding this system, um, some of this work, um, I, and this might be the very last slide. <laughs> the manufacturing sector to us is really important to, to rebuild in a, um, a service economy that we have become. We know that retail and service sectors, if, if you invest in a retail business or a service sector business, um, it only generates 60 cents on the dollar um, for the whole community. Whereas um, every dollar spent in the, the um, in the manufacturing sector equates to $1.40 of additional activity. Um, manufacturing is like the heartbeat of an economy. And so we continue to focus on how we can rebuild these systems of production in our community because we believe in the importance of that economic multiplier effect that manufacturing has and so few other industries, well, they just don't have it. So um, yeah, this is, Again, like what our work has become is how to rebuild our community infrastructure because of the value it will place on right livelihood for a multi, multiple economic and social stratas of our community. And then I'll leave you with this. This is a, I think this is a dated map, but it does show um, that there's people organizing at so many different levels. I mean, not every fiber shed is doing the same thing. They're all doing different things. Some are single women farmers organizing in guilds. Some are people trying to do their own one year wardrobe challenge. Some people are building local textiles and Emma um, and Deborah will speak more to this, but um, the, it's really the gamut. It's really just about opening your eyes to what your own land can yield and produce and how you can be in reciprocity with your own community. That's really the lens that Fibershed takes. And so people interpret that in multiple ways. And these are some of those communities looking at the landscape through that lens. All right, I will leave it there. And we can, um, I'll stop screen sharing. Thank you so much, Rebecca. That was a brilliant overview. And it included one of my very favorite diagrams, which is that soil to soil diagram. When I first saw that, it just, I don't know, it blew my mind to think like, oh yeah, of course my clothes can return to soil and they came from soil. Yeah, however, like invested in the food system I was, I hadn't really, it hadn't dawned on me. So that was brilliant, thank you. Um, so uh, now I wanted to invite um, Deborah and Gala Barker and Emma Haig to introduce yourselves each. Um, if you could just say a little bit about who you are, and what inspired you to get involved with Fibershed? That'd be brilliant. Um, Deborah and Gala, if you wanna go first. That's okay. Um, so I'm a, <coughs> I'm a natural dyer with a small um, fiber studio, a natural dyeing studio and a textile historian and a researcher and project manager in the visual arts. And uh, I first came across Rebecca's work when I was re looking at her film, the beautiful film she made about the one year wardrobe, which I recommend anyone listening to watch. And uh, my whole body just said, yes, I, I loved it. My head, heart and hands all responded with it with a big yes. And it connected so many things for me. I was brought up in the Sussex countryside. Um, I'd seen from the 1960s as I'd been a child in the countryside, I'd seen the sort of decimation of um, industrial agriculture and the building and how it had changed the whole environment, um, the biodiversity loss, and then obviously there was climate change. I studied design history and textiles in the 1980s and everyone was celebrating uh, industrialization, manufacturing. And I think I recognized even then that technological systems actually exist within biological systems. So that even at that point, I was feeling uncomfortable about all the synthetics that were increasingly being used. And um, having always lived in rural Sussex, I've got a real passion for the countryside and saw the pressures that farmers were being put under and the lack of um, uses for flock, for the sheep. Um, I think now it's 20 pence a fleece. Some of the farmers are getting less. Le le even less, God was saying which is just shocking. And then equally, we have this wool being imported from New Zealand, Australia, the Falklands. Um, so really the fiber share brought to, together an opportunity that like Rebecca was saying to 
try and connect some of the um, areas in my life, which was a designer's textiles with farmers and improving the soil and regenerating the soil through the regenerative practices at the same time. And I'm very grateful to Rebecca because the research that she's done has given us an incredible uh, evidence base on which to draw. There's lots of research and projects there that we can use as an inspiration. Um, so we're very, very much in the early stages of our fibre shed. We launched last year, we brought some designers down from London and showed them the impact making particular choices about the materials they use have on the land, um, with particular reference to Floor Hatch Farm, which is a biodynamic farm. And um, we're hoping to develop that relationship between farmers in the southeast and London, and those young designers who are very keen on finding materials which really help regenerate the landscape and support the rural, the rural economy, um, they have a profile and they have a media presence and we hope to use that to then change the whole kind of attitude, change the paradigm essentially. So. Um, I'm Gala, I'm one of the farmers at Watch. I've been here looking after the sheep for the last eight years. Um, I've always loved sheep, I've always loved wool and I, I can spin and knit, although now farming I don't really have time to do either of those things. <laughs> Um, and I, in the time I've been here, I've kind of I've developed the flock because I started with uh, like 20 sheep and now we've got 80. And I introduced Romneys because um, their wool's better. And we've always had wool processed um, into knitting yarn and do the old blanket and um, we do sheepskins. And then um, because my mum, Deborah, started doing uh, a lot of plant dyeing and so we've done plant dyeing workshops. and that's been a really good way to raise awareness about the wool and, and what's so different about our wool as opposed to the wool that people are buying. And um, I have had a lot of interesting discussions with people who come to want to buy our wool and just have, you know, that it costs me as much to have my wool processed as they're paying the wool that they're buying from Australia and it's, you know, being processed all over the place. And, and yeah, I think it's, it's a really interesting time and as mum said because the price this year is so low I think I've heard it as low as 5p a kilo for some breeds um, it's it's just such a, a time for farmers of just being like this isn't this isn't feasible we need some value from this amazing product it's it gets such a bad rap and um, you know it's such a fantastic product and I think yeah just I'm so inspired by Rebecca Burgess's book and and the whole idea that we could bring more value to all and maybe that it's a way that we can help farmers to to do better by the land because i think there's so much pressure put on farmers and you know so much a need for production 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 in terms of meat because the wool is, there's of so little value that actually if we can offer value in terms of they can actually get something for the fleets we can actually have some way of, of helping people to to do better by the soil and we're living, you know, it's really interesting actually in this part of the country, we're in total drought now. And I don't think it, it's not in the news because we had the right amount of rainfall. It just it all happened in three months at the beginning of the year. Um, so all of the <laughs> reservoirs are full, so no one's complaining yet. But we're really, it's really a struggle at the moment with the, with the drought. And, um, you know, it's just brought my awareness so much to the soil and that whole soil to soil textiles and, you know, how we can increase the carbon in the soil and yeah it's really um i'm really excited to see what we can do with it but as we say it's in the early stages so just trying to get all the things together so that we can start talking to people <laughs> great thank you both and emma would you like to share about yourself hi um i'm emma haig um, I'm the regional coordinator for the Southwest England Fibre Shed. And I guess my kind of interest in or experience of Fibre Shed goes back a while to when I was working in Peru. I spent nearly four to five years from 2008 onwards working in the Peruvian Andes with textile artisans, mostly women. Um, and we work to connect communities of fibre farmers with weavers, with spinners, with natural dyers, and eventually with a group of seamstresses who we trained in garment construction. So it really, it was that I was working in a fibre shed kind of type model, in fact, a pretty good one, given that almost all of those communities were within, within a 20 mile radius. 
Um, I just didn't know it then. And it was only moving back to England kind of around 2013. I moved to Somerset. Um, I happened to move very close to a large sheep farm that was farming not only for meat, but really trying to do the best they could to get value from the wool as well. Um, and quite innovative in that way, that's Fernhill Farm. Um, it's through being there and talking to them, kind of really came to understand how far our system in the UK, which was once a key textile manufacturing country for the world, how far we'd come to be from the kind of very neat, small, kind of vertically integrated system that I've been working with in Peru. And, um, and around about the same time, I came across Fibershell and thought, well, here is a, um, you know, here's someone and a community of other people who is talking about it in a language that makes sense. And I think I've been kind of missing that language. Um, so we affiliated the Southwest England Fibre Shed kind of on the spot, <laughs> had a conversation with Rebecca at the time. Um, and then I've really been through a couple of years of kind of evolving thoughts and concept projects which have involved um, Bristol Textile Quarter where I am now as a space for people to meet and connect. Um, the Bristol Cloth Project, which I co-founded with a friend, Babs Bean, which is a kind of exploration into bioregional cloth production and whether that's still possible in the UK. Um, and then, and it just feels like momentum is building in the UK. There's, there's increasing awareness. The book is a huge part of that um, now that that's available here. And in the last year or two, I think Deborah and Gala would agree there's there's, there's a huge amount of interest and it feels like the time is now to be to be building more of a organized movement. So at the moment in the Southwest, we're very much in the kind of stage of community building and having regular conversation between members. Um, who you can see on our website, um, we're starting to map those who are involved in our conversation um, and are excited to see where that takes us. Brilliant, thank you. Um, and then, yeah, I will also wanna say that, you know, Deborah, Gala, and Emma are also a great inspiration in so many ways. And you know what you guys have got underway with the Fiber Shed Southeast and the Fiber Shed Southwest, um, and connect. You know, really, I think what all all of you guys have in common is there's just such great integrity to all the connections and relationships you build, um, and really, you know, working truly with farmers and truly with the soil and really bringing that all the way through to the clothes and the, and through the natural dyes and yeah it's a great inspiration so thank you all and thank you for what you're bringing um so at this point i wanted to um open it up to a, a little bit of a conversation between the five of us um and i guess where i wanted to start with that was um it was you know the day when um these young designers came to visit Claw Hatch Farm. It was kind of, I think beforehand we were a little bit nervous because <laughs> it might be that they were really bored or uninterested, um, you know, looking at soil. It's not the first thing you think about as a young designer, but quite to the contrary, it was like this dawning, this moment of utter excitement and watching Gala herd the sheep around, you know, they were just like, whoa. <laughs> um, and I think, I guess I wanted to, to ask all, all of you guys a little bit about, you know, what has your experience been of connecting people to soil through clothing? Is, does that feel, um, you know, the soil to soil diagram, does that ignite people, do you think? And um, also, you know, Rebecca, the idea of be climate beneficial clothing, um, maybe you could talk a little bit about what that is. Um, yeah, maybe we could start there. You know, what is climate beneficial clothing? and um, how do people respond to those kinds of things? Which part? Oh my goodness. <laughs> well, maybe you could explain climate beneficial clothing first. Okay. Um, I do think that absolutely that people's connection between textile and soil first as a first step has been a journey. Um, and the reason why is because I, I don't know, I mean, Emma, you might be more familiar with this than I, but there's a a sustainability index. Um, it's a global index and it um, it's called the Hague Index. I think it was started by Walmart in Patagonia mm -hmm. and a lot of the design community is um, it, in design schools. I've taught in some of the design schools where my students are indoctrinated into this idea that natural fibers have this huge footprint 
and it's plastic fibers that have the smallest footprint. And this level of um, indexing and comparing has been going on, I, I want to say, since the mid 90s. Um, so when we started this idea of, oh, your textiles come, come from the soil and these soils have carbon flux, carbon can be lost, carbon can be gained, but it's, it's not the, um, you know, it's again, there's this great quote, like it's not the cow, it's the how, um, or it's, you know, it's not just the sheep, it's how you're managing these sheep. So you have to have a nuanced conversation about agriculture with an increasingly urban population uh, globally. And so I think, um, at least in my experience, we've had to unpack mental baggage around that Hague index as a first step, getting for those who are in the design community already, or those that are in the brand community already, for the general public, it was more like soil and textiles. I mean, it was more like, I don't, I didn't even, like remote connection was not even there. <laughs> so, so yes, I mean, we had two hurdles in the industry. We have that hurdle I just described of unpacking the baggage about agriculture and the role of agriculture in the carbon cycle, um, how it can be a destructive force to the carbon cycle, but it can, it's the only part of the, our economy that can become a net sink because it's a biologically based system. And then, yeah, and then there's the design community um, or the, the, the not design community who had such a hard time with it. So climate beneficial was the way we took it up a notch to say, um, let's get some scientists, some biogeochemists from UC Berkeley um, who are preeminent globally in, in their ability to measure carbon in soil. And, you know, it wasn't us who did this, but there was $8 million worth of research done to understand carbon cycling in our soils by another sister project. And they were able to track carbon molecules from the atmosphere a meter deep lodging that carbon lodging itself within six months a meter deep in the soil from the atmosphere a meter deep and once that once you track that carbon you can start to understand what practices enhance that drawdown and again what practices move it back into the atmosphere soil will always cycle carbon but the question is can you net more in than you're losing and you absolutely can. And it was measured in 2007. And in our community, that was the first time that we'd understood that you can net a climate positive impact on a working landscape, a landscape that is anthropogenically managed with livestock. Um, so once we figured that out, we were like, oh, let's take the LCA, the life cycle assessment one step further and get these biogeochemists to look at the textile supply chain. And then we developed this model whereby we looked at the mill equipment and all the energy systems to run mill equipment distribution cut and so, and we looked at geothermal, wind and solar. And if we pair renewable energy powered manufacturing with climate benefiting agricultural practices, you can create a textile that has an impact that is climate positive, meaning you can draw down more carbon into the soil through the production of a textile then you emit and that's a game changer because everything is about do less harm very few of the conversations we're having are about benefit like reverse climate change through your textiles basically like that's the conversation we can be having because we know it's possible we just have to build again more momentum to achieve those goals totally. Yeah. It got me very excited. <laughs> um, me too. So, uh, <laughs> uh, Emma, Gala, Deborah, do you have any thoughts on that? I, 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 was gonna say, I think actually bringing people onto the farm to experience the land does make a huge difference because um, you were there, Abby, but I think it wasn't until we were out in the fields and people could actually see the environment. They could see all this kind of rich herbal ray and they could feel the kind of richness of the biodiversity around them that they really began to understand and it was at the point where um, Gala picked up a shawl that has been produced organically, dyed organically and we said this can go back on the compost heap at the end of its life cycle and they were just blown away. I mean I just remember them saying it over and over again <laughs> and it, it really brought home how far our understanding of our you know where clothes came from just you know probably 120 
120 years ago now, um, that they were, well, 1880s, we started using natural dyes, but prior to that, everything would have been produced organically. And all our clothes would have just been recycled and put back on the compost heap. And I think when you, yes, when you start to see the landscape and you experience it and you start to really engage with the material, it's that sort of confluence that Rebecca was talking about, material culture and the landscape and our own interaction with it that really starts to help people understand. I also like to look to what's happening with food always <laughs> and not just because it's dinner time um but in terms of how kind of i guess consumer behavior has changed towards food and how there has been this slight and increasing shift towards more interest in locally produced food um ethically produced food of different kinds um csas buying into local veg boxes all of which has been i think um, emphasised even more during COVID, partly because people haven't had an option to source from further afield, but partly because there's this feeling actually we need to come together as a community. So while I think making the kind of the, the, the connection between fashion and farming can feel like maybe kind of quite a giant leap at the moment, if you think where we were with food, let's say two decades ago, even a decade ago, and where we've got to now, even with food composting, um, and community composting schemes for food. Um, I've, I've, I've kind of find that a kind of beacon of hope for where we might be with, with fashion and textiles in the coming years. Not me, totally. <laughs> um, and I was wondering, um, you know, it feels like Rebecca, you sort of emphasized this at the beginning um, and really in everything you guys just spoke about, it feels like, Fibre shed at the core of it, is it about relationship building? Is that the core of fiber sheds? Yeah, I think it inevitably always comes back to relationship building um, in all ways, in the ways of, um, like I just, just, you asked about the education um, and Deborah mentioned, you know, bringing people to the farm. You're always, um, you're, you're administering relationships, you're facilitating relationships, you're you're deepening relationships that are pre-existing and you're learning new things about those people and plants and animals all the time. And when you commit to a, to a geography, the depth of understanding becomes so great that it doesn't, it's hard to take the depth of understanding that you get from relationship building and make that a quantifiable statistic that would work to help say, I mean, I guess we do with Climate Beneficial, we've tried to be very science driven. But at the end of the day, you know, these are, these are systems that are built on, on relationships with all of the, and with not just two leggeds, you know, it's two leggeds, it's four leggeds, it's the plant community, um, it's the soil micro, micro fauna, <laughs> you know, we're, we're in relationship. And I think we're always in relationship. It's just like the carbon cycle. It's going on whether we harmonize with it or not. We're exhaling, we're inhaling. The plants are doing their version of that. The soil is respirating. But I think that the fiber shed gives you an opportunity or the model, like a watershed or a food shed, it gives you an, a model for, um, for resensitizing and building a sense of reverence for those things that are always going on around you. So relationships are almost like ways of acknowledging what already exists, you know, <laughs> um, consciousness, bringing this, these things to the surface is what a lot of the work is about. And I feel like part of the work of the fiber shed is also bringing our awareness into relationship with the things we can't see because it feels like a lot of the environmental work that's gone on is about what we can see the the big animals that are kind of extinct or the big animals and the way they're treated but it's the microbes and the small plants and as we know insects have been absolutely decimated in the last decade or two um, and coming into relationship with the whole bios you know the whole ecosystem the invisible and the visible i think is a really key part and the fiber shed I love the fact that it acknowledges that and also looks to indigenous communities who've maintained in you know, many instances that way of relating to the whole ecosystem, the biosphere. 
Thank you, Deborah. <laughs> Um, Emma, I know you had a question for Rebecca that kind of nicely follows on from that. Maybe mm. you could ask it at this point. Yeah, I mean, I think for a lot of people first coming across fibre sheds, they may understand it kind of first and foremost as an eco fashion initiative, potentially, and that's probably quite common. Um, and the reality is it's not. It's, it's a lot more than that. And I guess the, there's a quote from the online um, series and regenerative textiles that, that Fibers had hosted recently that perfectly encapsulated it, which is social inequity is a form of ecological imbalance that will result in ecological erosion. And I would say the reverse of that is probably true too. Um, and I really appreciated the emphasis on this. Um, actually, this I think that episode took, took part before BLM. Um, it's obviously become more, more pertinent since and poignant. Um, and I guess I wondered if you could just talk to that a little more in a way you have already, but I, specifically around how and at what point um, the social aspect became almost um, as inherent a part of the fibre shed model as the environmental um, and how you see that playing out on the ground at the moment amongst your members and affiliates, uh, maybe those that are a bit further ahead than us. Mm. It's a, a really great multi-layered question for, for me. Um, thank you for asking it. Um, well, the, the man who, um, the quote came from Gopal Dayani, Dayanani, um, he, he brought forward um, a really important thing for us to think about too, like our soil to soil model has these icons, but it, it misses like the people are not in there. So that's one layer that we've recently added to soil to soil is putting like the human in the <laughs> system. Like, oh yeah, there's, there's the shepherdesses and there's people in that manufacturing building. And it's not just scissors cutting and sewing, it's a human cutting and sewing. So, um, if we don't acknowledge um, the human, and, and so Fibershed did start with human relationships that were really like a hubaloo of pretend, you know, a lot of women and men who were looking to solve for local economic problems. I think they were attracted to it because it was like, we can do better than this. We don't have to import these things and grow all this stuff and sell it for nothing or not sell it at all, just put it in a ditch. Like those basic major glaring problems is what brought us into relationship. So then if you start to deepen that and you think, okay, well in California, you dial the clock back to World War II, um, the California interned Japanese rice farmers and sent them to the Dakotas and white landowners usurped a lot of those farms and reparations were provided on a monetary level, but land was stayed stolen basically. Dial the clock back further, um, white colonists were allowed into the gold rush experience of California, but black land um, interested basically African-American community members from the Southeast were not welcomed into Oregon and California. They weren't allowed to take part in the extraction of the gold rush. They were kept out. Then the gold rush, of course, brought white settlers who were given mandates and support by the United States government to disrupt fiber sheds that were already here, water sheds that were already here, and food sheds that were already here. And so California is one of the most diversely linked, it has one of the most in-depth linguistic diversity locales in the world, meaning the land is so abundant here or was that you could define your language to a plant or a bird within a watershed scale because you didn't have to migrate long distances to get what you needed and so people developed intimate language based on watersheds. So the linguistic diversity across the state was mind blowing and there's almost no analog to it. So white settlers coming into already highly functioning in-depth precision forms of agriculture, they thought it was like a wild landscape, but it was people managing hazel and redbud and sedge, um, 
deer grass, all of these systems to make watertight baskets, beautiful clothes adorned with abalone um, in the coastal region where I'm from in Coast Miwok territory. So I think what's been hard for all of us is how do we repair, and I don't think it's, I don't know if it's in my lifetime, I, I hope to see it in my lifetime, but how do we repair the disruption of the endemic fiber shed when we're bringing the Eurocentric crops and the Eurocentric model overlaying it in a way that was violent, in a way that was, we're still on unseated land. Um, you know, I, I don't know how we're gonna work all through all of this or if we are going to. Some days I'm like, I just have to go back to where my ancestors are from and like, you know, leave, leave this behind because what we did was so wrong. But um, I do think there's a way through. Sorry. <laughs> no, thank you. I think, you know, it is, it's something that we're discussing more and more here in the UK as well. Um, obviously, it's a, a different historical context in some ways, but we are, we are all in this together and we are all asking the questions of land and land ownership and what it means to, to be on land today. Um, so I think it is a really important part of it, and we do, yeah, thanks for sharing. Hmm. So um, at this point, I mean, I don't know, Deborah and Emma, if you have any reflections on that from a UK perspective at this point. Um, I know, yeah. I need to agree with you. I think there's a lot of work to do to understand how fibers and textiles have been produced through exploitation of land and labor in the past. Um, uh, and we have to understand that before we can create like an, an improved system going forward. So that's, you know, there's, there's work set out for us. Totally. Um, and the fact, oh, sorry, and the fact that it's so linked, the ecological and the social, you, that, that's for me one of the big insights as well, is that actually if we want to have the soil-to-soil -soil system, we, we can't ignore the social. <laughs> it's, it's not going to work. Um, and so that, you know, that is really, I think, a deep insight and something we all get to look into. Um, and definitely something you touch on in the book in a quite inspirational way. Um, I just wanted, before, I'm gonna to go to questions because we had had quite a lot of questions, um, but I wanted to just at this point um, allow you each to express a few words about what your, what your vision for the future is, um, whether that's in the, you know, the context of Fibershed UK or Fibershed globally. If you could each say a few sentences on that, that would be great. Uh, maybe we'll start with um, Gala. You want to go? <laughs> um, I would just love to get to a place where where wool is appreciated, I suppose, because it does get such a bad rap, particularly. And um, yeah, it would just be amazing to to see it being appreciated and used in all the wonderful ways that it can be used. Yeah. Deborah? Um, it sort of goes back to what Rebecca was saying really. I think um, we have a deep his history of colonization and taking resources from other places without permissions or exploiting the people we're taking it from. And to begin to think about what it might mean to live within the resources that we have, particularly in relation to textiles, and to really begin to understand what our impact is by directly relating to textile production with our own, within our own fibre shed. And then it becomes very apparent that the cost that there is to the social cost, environmental cost, um, yeah. And, if, and that working with these young designers and with the sort of younger generation gives me huge hope because they're so passionate about changing the whole system and reimagining the future. So, yeah. Um. Emma? Um, well, for me, I think it goes back to food again. Um, and I can see one of the attendees has left 
um, put a put a question in the Q and A to the same to the same extent. Do you think we can follow some of the examples of the food system and start people pre-ordering clothing in the same way that you do with the food box scheme? So that obviously supports the farmers and minimises waste and prevents the problem of there being a very expensive product that's been invested in, with there being no market at the end. And this is actually the the kind of the model that the Bristol cloth took. Um, so yeah, I think kind of yeah pre pre pre-ordering, pre-selling of, of clothing, availability of yarn in your local bulk food eco shop. Um, um, yeah, I think we've got to look to the systems that are working better and, and, and then translate the cost of fibres and textiles as best we can. Brilliant. And Rebecca, would you like to share a yes. bit of your vision? Oh, I think I would love to see um, fiber sheds working across um, lines more. If we had more capacity <laughs> here in North Central California, we would love to have more time to understand what the learnings are in um, within Emma's work and Deborah's work and other fiber sheds. Because I do think that um, we could be helping one another for policy at the policy level at the um, I just think about all of the, the work that gets done to fund certain technologies in agriculture or in textiles globally through the International Monetary Fund or through the World Bank. I think about how much money goes out to grease the wheels for some of the things that are not as helpful to our future. <laughs> um, and so I'm very interested in understanding how we can hold up the stories of each place and say, you know, there's all, then there are some parallels here if we all had access to this, this would lift up, you know, a hundred regional economies to a point of self-sufficiency that they would not need to take resources from this part of the world to prop up their lives. They would actually be taking full responsibility for their clothing, for their food. And I think people want to be able to take responsibility for their clothing and food in many cases, but they aren't given opportunities. So I think um, our vision would be to maybe work across pan fiber shed strategy <laughs> to figure out how to build up these regional economies. Um, so. Brilliant. Okay, well, I've got a whole roster of questions for you guys. Um, thank you everyone who's been posting questions as we go. Really brilliant. Um, I'm gonna go through them kind of in order to a certain extent. Um, and the first, question was from Terry Boo um, and it was what's your opinion on hemp agriculture and hemp based clothing is it possible to manufacture hemp clothes in the United States Currently, it's for Rebecca um, it's in process it's not there yet the issues have been there's so much lignin and pectin in hemp which makes it so durable it's hard to remove that material um, Again, there's traditional ways of removing that material through dew redding. Um, and there's a beautiful traditions I've seen of, of hand woven hemp in Eastern Europe, Northern Thailand. I've explored a lot of beautiful, simple technologies for producing a hemp textile. But if you're going in the US, of course, everything is kind of scaled up um, and there's all these, seek, everyone's seeking efficiencies. And so, in seeking efficiencies, you, you do in hemp, you need to remove that pectin and lignin sometimes at a faster pace to be able to compete, hemp to, for hemp to compete with cotton or to compete with polyester, unfortunately. Um, so some of the technologies to soften hemp, um, we've evaluated to see if there's ways of doing it ecologically, um, and there are. And I think that the, the companies doing that, there's one out of Belgium, um, there is also, um, companies and one in actually in Alabama and there's others who are looking at ecological processing and I think we're only six or seven months off from at least one company issuing an American hemp um, product it'll probably probably be blended with other fibers for a while just because of how the manufacturing systems were so centered around cotton You'll probably see cotton hemp blends, hemp wool blends. We might we might be a little ways off from a hundred percent hemp textile. And I know, I mean, there's been discussion of it in the UK, and we're making things like hemp crete, mm. but I haven't 
I don't know. I don't know if you guys know of anyone making 100% hemp materials. Currently, we don't have the um, milling machinery to be able to process hemp specifically for textile fibers. It's a slightly different process. What's really promising is that we have hemp farms and we have a lot of farmers who really want to grow more hemp. It can fit very well into a crop rotation system. Um, and I know of one company at the moment who is researching, who's growing hemp for, I think for oil primarily, um, but is researching into the machinery that still exists in Europe for processing hemp for fibers on a commercial scale. So yeah, for, I mean, it's, it's quite exciting. There are companies already seeing that potential and interested in diversifying too. Cool. And there's a number of people in the chat mentioning different places growing it as well. Um, so my next, qu next question, um, Gala, Deborah, this definitely speaks to you guys, is if the cost to farmers and producers means that UK wool is seen as expensive, how do we start to bridge the gap? Or if we can't, how do we make people aware that this local product is worth spending more on? And that was from Haley Dumont. What do you guys think? Well, <clears throat> I don't know, I think it is it's quite a difficult area and I think it, I mean, it speaks a lot to that, the thing we were talking about, you know, someone always loses out when you sell something cheap, like it's not cheap, someone's lost out, the soil's lost out somewhere in the system, someone isn't getting what they need and um, I guess as I said, like doing our plant dyeing workshops really help and I think, you know, we just have to keep telling the story I, I mean, you know, I Instagram and I write things and, you know, people read Rebecca's book, maybe that will help them understand. And I think, yeah, I think it's, it really comes down to value. I mean, I think there are people that are ready to hear it. And, you know, you, you say, look, you, you're paying more money for food because you believe it's better for the environment, it's better. You know, like, have you thought about your clothes? You know, have you ever considered that that is something that also has a whole process that, could be damaging and I think a lot of people haven't so but I think I mean watching the chat like a lot of people are talking about processing and actually that is a huge barrier in the UK processing is just a massive thing you know I, I can get um she was on earlier and she's a natural fiber company and they do one organic run a year I don't know of any other organic processes at, at the moment and they do one organic run a year and because they only do one organic run and I guess it's a bit complicated they never quite know when it's going to be and you know in terms of me like making any kind of plan with anyone for what that wool might be turned into that's really difficult because someone could come to me and say you know I'd really love to use your wool for this jumper or something and I'd say well I don't know when I can have it ready <laughs> and that's that is a really big problem so I think there is a lot of um, work needed on that front just to have it available because it's at the moment it's not available. Yeah, and I think I, I do think the pandemic has really made people think about the cost. You know, we've seen the vulnerability of global supply chains, and increasingly we're aware that cheap clothes, cheap wool, um, often means enslaved labour. You know, we've perhaps seen in China what's happening with the um, cotton industry there, and or people being paid very badly. You know, the Rana Plaza is much more in consciousness with a the factory that collapsed in India where poorly working conditions and I think partly we have to start to just change the paradigm and stop people thinking that they have a right to cheap clothes and actually think instead that people have a right to right livelihoods and to pay people properly for what they do and to ensure that it's not at the cost of future generations by depleting the soil and the biosphere um, and that is storytelling as Gala was saying I think it's uh, and, it, and it is also that I mean I, I think it might have been on Marvellous farmer on a um, cereal series. Uh, they're talking, saying, you know, because people are always saying to us, you know, we produce biodynamic food, like, oh, but your food's so expensive. And it's like, yes, it's expensive for a reason. <laughs> and it's, you know, it's not really expensive if you look at w what we can do for the environment and how good it is for you and how good it tastes. But, you know, I think. We just have to really, yeah, we just have to keep telling the story and also the, the fact that it's expensive and people can't afford it, that is a policy issue. We have a, we have an entire economic system that is set up so that people can't afford food of any kind, never mind our food. So, I mean, that's just so wrong. Totally. 
Um, okay, I'm just gonna we're, I'm gonna bring this to the close in the next five minutes. So we're just gonna ask some of the last questions. Um, but some of the questions coming through are, you know, it's a little bit like how do people get involved with fiber sheds, um, and you know how do we increase the milling capacities, and how do you if you want to buy these clothes, how do you get involved? Like. What does it look like from here to be part of this movement for everyone who's watching? Emma's quite a bit further ahead than us, so I don't know if Emma wants to speak to that. Well, I think um, first kind of port of call is to look to see where your local regional affiliate is. Um, we've got the Southwest, uh, which I coordinate, Deborah in the Southeast. Um, I believe there's one on the way in London as well. Um, and Justine from the Wild Diary in the North Wild Diary, that's D-Y-E-R-E, -E, um, in the Northwest. Um, we are all going about kind of establishing fiber sheds in our own ways, but we speak regularly so that hopefully there'll be some alignment nationally. And it's that kind of alignment that we need to be able to tack some of the bigger, tackle some of the bigger challenges, for example, the mid-tier infrastructure. Um, so I think it is very important to community build on a regional level so we have some chance of having human to human relationships. Um, but the kind of supply chain issues uh, in the UK, at least it's certainly worth looking at nationally. We're not a big, huge country. Um, and, and if you're part of your local regional fibre shed, then hopefully that's a conversation you get to be part of. Mm, totally. Um, and well, we're going to, I know that we're going to follow, send a follow up email with kind of details of how to get in touch with each of the regional fiber sheds. Um, and I certainly know that there's going to be ongoing conversations and hopefully ongoing storytelling around fiber sheds across the UK. Um, and I wonder, you know, it'd be interesting, you know, is the first step, is it to start building these relationships? Is it for farmers to come forward and start to say, here's where, you know, here's how I could be involved and then to connect with the designers does that feel like the first step it's certainly the step for the southeast that's the um that's the main sort of focus for us is to to create a directory of farmers and then link them to london designers and um actually emma was saying she thought there was a london fiber shed but i've spoken to the person that was going to do that and we're going to keep it as one southeast but i'm working with her um on a project in london um, and hers is more focused on creating small dye gardens and small projects in London and ours is more on a kind of um, strategic level connecting with the fashion industry. So at the moment we're just in the process of getting our website up and running but we will be doing creating a directory and in the meantime I would just suggest if people um, can come to either email Plorhatch Farm and Gala will pass the... Um, Don't email Plorhatch Farm. <laughs> I'll be in trouble. Sorry yes. Website, uh, newsletter. Yes, I know. Flight Flock newsletter on Flight Flock.com. Sorry. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> yeah, Flight Flock, Flock newsletter. And then we will um, say once the um, website's live and people, we start trying to build the directory. And also, if you join up to, uh, if you're on Instagram and you can um, join up to Instagram, Southeast England Fibre Shed then we will actually notify people when there are eventual projects happening. We are volunteer, voluntary at the moment. We don't get paid at all for what we do. So we have to be really strategic and I'm really focused on applying for grants. And once we have grants coming in and we can start to develop projects, then we'd be really excited to talk to as many people as possible. So, yeah, that, people want to be involved. I would love to see some core um, some core funding support for organizers. That's something that um, our fiber shed is, is continuing to look at. We have a small micro grants project or set of funds, but we're pretty aware that we need to marshal more um, support so that network hubs, people functioning as a hub, um, you know, need, need support for that. But I'm so grateful for the volunteerism. I mean, I, 10 years volunteering and then we started to build out some monies through grants and it has allowed us allowed us to build a, a small staff um, you know for four people as core employees um, it's possible to do that and it, it requires I think it's a certain inflection point in the organizing enough um, 
grant support or what have you, because again, the, the economy isn't working right now <laughs> in the ways we need it to. And so it does require some support to, to take a bird's eye view and build out the producer networks, the designer networks, the, the cloth projects, showing what's possible. That's all time and resources. And I think, yeah, at a certain point, we need to figure out how to get people more core operating funding to make the economic transition. It's like we have one foot on the boat and one foot on the dock. <laughs> I feel like we're slowly gonna, maybe not so slowly now under the current conditions, really pivot towards these regional economic projects in ways that support us all in the ways that we want in our home community with local employment, right livelihoods in our local communities. That's the goal. But I know we're in a, a flex moment. So yeah, we'll keep talking about <laughs> core operating support for you all. Thank you so much, all of you. Um, Gala, Deborah, Emma, and Rebecca. Um, brilliant to hear from all of you. And I think the conversation will and must continue um, well, I'll try and get answers to as many of the other questions for people. Maybe we could send out a few answers in the, in the follow-up email. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, this really is the beginning. I would encourage everyone to read the book, Fibershed book, because, you know, a lot of the life cycle analysis stuff, some of the background to the climate stuff, all of the diagrams are in the book. So you can really get to grips with them and use them as tools for telling the story forward. Um, and for us to really build the Fibershed UK movement. Um, and yeah, I think it's a really exciting time. So thank you all. And thank you to Chelsea Green and Groundswell for putting this web series or webinar series together. So I'm gonna leave it there and say- if you're, if you're a busy farmer, you can listen to it on, the, on Audible. <laughs> There you go. The Fibershed book, yes, you can listen to it. <laughs> Perfect. Yep. And um, do, actually, you can tune into Farmrama as well and hear Gala talking a bit about Fibershed. And hopefully, Emma will be on there soon talking a bit about Bristol, Bristol, text, Bristol cloth. Um, and maybe even one day we'll have Rebecca on there. Um, and Deborah talking about natural dyeing. So tune in, um, stay tuned, and we will build this from here. Thank you all. Thank you.